carry on. So point three is <laughs> we got to be real clear on point three. Friedrich Schleiermacher, did I miss him? Did I forget to talk about Friedrich? I did, didn't I? Miss Friedrich Schleiermacher. We have a strong movement to spend time on Friedrich Schleiermacher. The, uh, if you want to hear about Schleiermacher, tell him to come in, Bob. <laughs> when we were in the seminary, the professor said that was a bad word. He'd say shades of Schleiermacher. Shades of Schleiermacher. You remember that. Your memory is much better. <laughs> you remember that, Bob. So. Yeah, I, di I didn't. Uh, and the, the great uh, example in the Protestant world, I did miss that. I mentioned Rahner as being the great figure for the modern paradigm and Catholic circles and Friedrich Schleiermacher would be that for the in the Islamic world. I never heard it. For in the Protestant world, thank you. Thank you. Anyway, Schleiermacher was a great figure, a paradigmatic figure. Karl Barth said he's the father of all modern theology. And I always think of his book he wrote in 1799 on religion, speeches to its cultured despisers. So he was very interested in the Enlightenment and looking at the rationalists, talking to them, the cultured despisers of religion and finding a way to make the religion real to them. Now this brings us to the second part of this uh, presentation out of three parts. <laughs> um, that is our attempt to uh, understand Islam. And again, let's uh, be clear on the ground rules here. I'm talking about how Hans Kung perceives this. I mean, we could, I could talk about how John Hicks sees it or Karl Barth or a lot of other people. So I'm looking at one figure and, and seeing how he looks at this general dialogue. Someone asked me at the break, what was the background to Muhammad in seventh century Arabia? Well, in general, it was um, a tribal society. There were various clans. Most of them had their own gods. It was a polytheistic world. I think women were not well treated in that society. Uh, the wealthy people in Mecca did not really attend to the poor like they should. So Muhammad um, has these revelations, uh, one of which in which he goes to Jerusalem and is lifted up. And um, he has, so he has these various ecstatic mystical, no, I don't know if mystical is right, prophetic experiences. And uh, out of that, um, he, his, his statement of it, he sees himself as the prophet to Arabia. He doesn't see himself as the son of God or a divine figure. He sees himself as the messenger, or one of the words he likes to use, translated there as the warner, W-A-R-N-E-R, -E he warns people about um, the way they're not living life correctly. And so he uh, preaches this in Mecca, and uh, the wealthy class don't, doesn't like it. And then he um, his starts to have some of his followers leave there and go to Medina. And, um, and then he himself goes, and through, then he, he gets there, and he's able, there's Jewish communities there, uh, in, and also Christian communities in Medina, and um, interacts with them there. He calls them the people of the book. And he always saw the people of the book very differently from the pagans. And in Islamic countries, the people of the book were always accorded greater honor, 
respect than others. So in Islamic countries, for example, Christians and Jews would not be expected to convert to Islam. They would have tolerance. They would be able to continue to practice their own religion. So that's, he set the tone for that. He had a positive outlook on the people of the book. And then eventually he comes back to, to Mecca. And by the time of his death, and I mean in an amazingly spectacular fashion, he's united the whole of Arabia and all these tribes into this one monotheistic uh, religious grouping, uh, in which we call Islam, which is, the doctor has pointed out to us, is, um, you know, means surrender. So, uh, and then within, and this is another remarkable thing, within a generation or so, the Quran is written down in Arabic in the form in which we have it, which is, again, I mean, one of the faster canonical efforts I've ever seen at, at establishing a canon, an official book. And of course, um, as uh, the people of the, called the Jews and the Christians, the people of the book, and of course his followers became the people of the book in a supreme way. So it's the Quran that holds them together. It's the Quran, which is the classic statement of Arabic. It's um, so stylistically and so on. It's, uh, you know, the Imams memorize the Quran. Uh, young students in the seminaries in Pakistan right now, we see them on television memorizing the Quran. That's part of, uh, so that book is so important to them. It's the book that holds these people together. As we know, most Muslims are not Arabs. Well, vast majority of Muslims are not Arabs. We got Muslims all over. We got seven million Muslims here in the United States. You got uh, Muslims in China, and, you know, I mean, they're just all over the place. Uh, they're, and it's not, uh, and as uh, Huntington says, they will be the largest religious grouping by 2025. 30% of the world's population, that's his projection. And it's commonly said today there's 1.2 billion Muslims in the world. And what unites them is the Quran. And uh, that is a very conserving factor because that Quran, you don't interpret it, you repeat it in a way. You, you, and you don't, you know, have um, your prayer the, prayer, the public prayer and the bowing is all strictly regulated. You know, say, well, let's bow in another way now. We have a modern innovation, we'll bow this way or something. No, you do it the exact way and you repeat the exact verses of the Quran. So it has an intensely conserving, conservative bent to it, keeping things the same throughout history. Um, I'll go back to the point, which uh, I believe is true. I tried to verify this this morning. I know, and I know there are Islamic scholars who are using modern biblical, uh, modern critical methods on the Quran, um, and I don't know who they are. I don't know their names. I've not talked to them. I made a minor effort to do that this morning, but was unsuccessful. So, but I know from my reading that it is not just the, the view that the doctor represented is not total across the Islamic board. I know that. There are scholars who are doing what we consider modern critical studies of the Quran. And in, in um, Kung's book, uh, he, he does mention some of those people. They didn't ring bells with me because I don't know them. Um, I think that um, part of the, you know, I think I give a little bit of the history there, but that's all well known or can be looked at. And in you know, the five pillars of Islam, 
I mean, people sort of generally know those these days. I mean, we fast during Ramadan, right? A month Ramadan, and we make the pilgrimage to Mecca once in a lifetime if you can. And uh, we we have the five times the daily prayers and the alms giving. They're expected to give between two and a half and ten percent of income to charity to the poor. Um, it's very. Um, you know, wonderful ideal of sort of sharing the wealth in a way of trying to help the poor. So you've got to remember that Muhammad did a great job of improving the social conditions in his own time in Medina and Mecca. He got the wealthy people to try to do more to help the poor, and he raised up the standing of women in that polytheistic tribal society. So the, we see all of those things of our ways of seeing therefore Muhammad as a genuine prophet. In line with the uh, great prophets of old, of people who heard the word of God and uh, were convinced of the one God, who were passionate about proclaiming it, not as their own word, but as the word of God, and uh, who saw that that word of God had to make a difference in the world and create a better social structure. So that's the kind of way that we would maybe make more specific the claim that Christians today can see Muhammad as a genuine prophet. Now, I was suggesting this sweep of history which becomes really important in looking at the way it is our own day and I I mean, we, right from the seventh century on we got this tremendous expansion of Islam um, they uh, control the world, they're the dominant cultural force, although I suppose some Chinese people would dispute that. Well, one of them, let's put it that way. Surely more powerful than European civilization. And this extends all the way into the 16th century. And despite, they start having losses in Spain and cutting back in ways. But um, some people say that all the way into the 19th century, the Islamic world saw themselves as the great civilization, as the bearer of civilization, all the way into the 19th century. And then, of course, what happens is the Western world, the Christian world, through the advances of science and advanced military weapons and secularization, urbanization, science, technology, age of discovery, and so on, the Western world now in the 19th century begins to expand. We've got colonialism and even into the traditional Islamic lands. So by the end of World War I, the West is in control of the worlds, more or less, you know, and can carve up the world. I mean, it, you know, you take something like Kuwait, that would be an example out of the Islamic world that they hate and, and see the, the way we determine. I mean, we had uh, uh, Wilson and working with the British and the French and carving up the world and essentially taking the Muslim countries, Islamic world, and, and making kingdoms that we could fundamentally control, power over. So, I mean, as I said, but what's Kuwait? I mean, that's an invention of the West. We're coming to defend Kuwait. Well, Kuwait is something we made. Um, so that's the dominant line you will get uh, from uh, the Muslim world, that, uh, that this set up this colonialism. And I listened to the news accounts, and when they interviewed Muslim people and so on after September 11th, word that appeared over and over is, we have been humiliated by the West. Dominant mindset, where in the West it was fear, always John Damascene, and Islam is the enemy, and we got to fight and mount crusades, and we're going to do that. Uh, fear. In the Islamic world today, I believe one of the dominant motifs is we've been humiliated by the West. We were the dominant civilization, we were the bearers of culture, and we were tolerant people. And we let the Jews and Christians alone. And uh, now the West got on top, and they're dominant, and they've uh, imposed their ways upon us. So when you say, back, what set um, bin Laden off originally? American troops going into Saudi Arabia. 
Why? That's the land, holy land. That's where the Mecca and Medina are. That's where you make your pilgrimage. That's where the Kabbalah is. And, that's, and no other foreigners can go in there. And so the fear, as I understand it, was that now the Western ways will corrupt our Islamic culture. So th this becomes, as I read it, and I'll take cre uh, responsibility for this, and I'll just throw it off on Kung, but that the, since September 11th, this becomes clearer, um, you know, this question, why are we hated? No, and I think the answer comes back because we have humiliated, that's how people see themselves, have been humiliated by the West. And therefore, the West is the enemy. And of course, the West is represented mainly by us, the United States. And so we need to do something about that. The other great enemy, as I see it, is modernity, the modern world. And that uh, brings us, um, I've got to see if I want to... I, I better do just a little bit more background before I go into into uh, into the fundamentalism question, but that's that's where we're getting to. L let's um, just uh, look at um, something about the way Islam sees Jesus and all of that, and uh, where we might try to open up a dialogue, in which I have tried to to do uh, before. Um, Jesus is, um, the, the Quran has the virgin birth. Well, it talks about the, you know, it's miraculous, as the doctor said before, it's a miraculous birth. Mary is mentioned more times in the Quran than in the New Testament. Well, we've got, uh, it's amazing, the sort of respect that is had for that part of our tradition. And Jesus is seen as a great prophet. And he is uh, one who works miracles, seen as a miracle worker. Well, but then we get to the deviation, which becomes so revealing in this dialogue. And that is, in the Quran, Jesus does not die on the cross. They condemn him to die on the cross, but God saves him, that humiliation, and takes him up into heaven, does not die on the cross. Now that begins to suggest things about our, the differences that we see in Christianity and in, and in Islam. And I, just to fill in the picture, there is, uh, in the Quran, we do not hear the story of the Good Samaritan, for example. It's not in the Quran. We do not hear all of Jesus' statements about forgiving the enemy, but forgiving 70 times 7. Well, that part of it isn't in there. We don't find in the Quran the critique of the law. The law, you know, where Jesus is saying, you know, the law is for the sake of people. <laughs> you know, don't get carried away with keeping laws. All that stuff about curing on the Sabbath and that, and all that, all of Jesus' talk against legalism is not found in the Quran. We don't find the story of the prodigal son in the Quran. One of the things that I try to do in dialogue with Muslims, and have done it publicly, uh, is to invite them to look at that part of Jesus, our, our way of seeing Jesus, those, which, those stories which are really distinctive for us. The prodigal son story is my favorite story, I think, in all of the Gospels. And to say, well, just look at it from our viewpoint. Read those stories. Read that part about Jesus, which is not in your holy book, and see what that might do for you. Um, and there's a, there's a, a great uh, emphasis, uh, again, in the Quran, in looking at Jesus to make sure that we don't see him as God. Oh, that, uh, and uh, to rejection of the Trinity. Now, I'm, I'm going to turn this back as a critique upon us, but the critique that would come the other way when we begin to look at the Christianity, the critique we offer to our Muslim friends from the, from the gospel perspective is to um, broaden the understanding of Jesus, to see what that understanding of Jesus would mean in terms of the way women are treated, 
And as we would put that forward, we Catholic community would have to say, we have to have a self-critique here. No, does the Jesus movement really need to rule out women's ordination? Isn't there a thrust in the Jesus movement towards total equality for women? So if we're going to put that forward to our Muslim friends, what would the story of Jesus mean in terms of the way women are treated in Islamic countries, for example, uh, or the way uh, we look at what's happening with the Taliban today and that uh, documentary was out beneath the veil? You know, we just have to say, what would the, what would the message of Jesus uh, have to, uh, what sort of critique would that set uh, up for you in looking at your own religious tradition? And also, what would the critique of Jesus of the law, of seeing religion as fundamentally a matter of law, what would that do? I think you will find in, in a, a genuine difference here um, I realize that within Islam there's what we call a mystical tradition, the Sufi tradition, and the language of the Sufis is often very much a love language. The language of the Quran itself is not a love language. I mean, you don't have a statement in there like God is love, as we would find in the Johannine literature. No, there's nothing like that. May I disagree? You may disagree in immediately or right now. Take the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> 30 seconds to disagree on God, love language. There is a lot of verse in the Quran, and that's what I, I take about my brother when they criticize the Quran without reading the whole Quran. Like they take, pick and choose verses from the Quran and take it out of context. There is a lot of verses in the Quran which ask Muslims for forgiveness, for perseverance, for praying, and wait till God come with his orders. A lot. Muslims been persecuted, the follower of Muhammad at the beginning, and the message were forgive, persevere, pray, and ask God, and ask God for help. This is uh, to answer that. Uh, uh, the, the you point. would not find a statement in the Quran, God is love. Not exactly the same way. But God is the merciful, is the compassionate, is the comforter. There are 99 names for God, is the attribution of God in Islam. And you can, all of them contain love. And one of them is not Father. Could not talk. No, one of the 99 names is not Father. Absolutely, because we don't <laughs> believe that God is a human. God is not being. God is omnipower. We don't know what God is. God is light. God is created the earth, created the heavens, created everything. He controls everything. We cannot imagine what God looks like. And, and, and that's the, the, the beauty for me. I can imagine God through his, his doing. And that's what God really said in the Quran. You look around you in the universe and within yourself, and you will see God. You will see the truth. And I am a physician, and I dissected the human body. And I could see God in every part of our body. If you see how we function as human beings from uh, inside, if you look around you in the nature, if you look at the sky, if you look at if, in, in how God created the world, it's, it's amazing. So I don't want to really limit God to a certain picture. I want to see God beyond any imagination. It's the love, the compassion, the, the merciful. It's, his attribution is beyond counting. And that's the way I would like to see God. And I, this is the way I would really love to imagine God. I don't want to constrict God in any way or form. And I think a lot of people would like to do that. And, and that's give me the peace inside. Because if I have any problem or any trouble, there is something beyond, beyond imagination can take care of me. I want to use, uh, I thank you, and I want to use that as a springboard to turn the critique back, hoping that the other critique is heard in the Muslim world, or that we find our way to invite our Muslim friends to reflect on our Good Samaritan story, and on our story of forgiveness of enemies, and the prodigal son story, and Jesus' critique of the law, 
and um, seeing that uh, all of that. So that, that's like an invitation to our Muslim friends to, uh, to listen to, to that side of it and to see what that would mean practically in terms of um, geopolitical decisions, what it would mean in terms of uh, interactions between civilizations, what it would mean in terms of the treatment of women in Islamic societies. Then the critique gets turned back on us, which I think the doctor uh, you know, said extremely well, and uh, which we need to hear when we enter into the dialogue. So one of the charges always, and, and I'm this, we've had some wonderful dialogues on this campus, is the charge that we Christians are really atheists, that uh, we lost monotheism, that our doctrine of the tree has taken us astray, and that we end up thinking there are three gods. And I may say that uh, that Islamic critique echoed by my own teacher, Karl Rahner, who said, if we Christians walk around and tell the next generation there are three persons in one God and do that at the beginning of uh, this time street, they will in an only way, and that's three gods. Because the word person, our culture, language means an individual sense of consciousness. That's what we mean by it. So it's an interesting uh, combination of people come from the Muslim world and our own in Scott Runner, that we have to way of thinking about God that proves monotheism and finds there's one God and what fall into pythium. So that's a, a great of this dialogue that uh, forced to think how we present the Trinitarian doctrine. And there is, um, again, the idea that before us is his servant. Uh, that's the way to understand Jesus as the messenger of God, prophet, a prophet, and uh, a prophet, and as the servant. That's their characteristic phrase. And uh, the Islamic word is little used for the Hellenist paradigm that we discussed, which originated with origin, in which origin used a lot of Greek categories to explain what the faith is all about. And um, one of the things that Islam would uh, help us to do is to, to relativize all of that language, to realize its limitations as well as its strengths, to remember that the New Testament doesn't talk about Jesus like that. It's nothing about two natures and one person and Jesus in the New Testament. There's uh, not the way that we speak about him. In the synoptics especially, we find him as, they say, as the servant of God, the prophet, the, the savior, uh, the man like us in all things except sin, who proclaims uh, to God, the one who, uh, as Rahner likes to say, shuddered before the mystery of God. Um, the, the one who uh, prayed to God who um, sacrificed to God, called for submission to God, so that all of that um, is uh, uh, the Muslim community moves us back into taking seriously the synoptic tradition on Jesus and to, to rethink how we're going to say that. And uh, also, again, picking up on the doctor said uh, beautifully about God, uh, God is finally inexhaustible, inexpressible, kind of language that would be very familiar to me beyond all our words and images. St. Thomas Aquinas said the most important thing we can know about God is that we don't know God. That um, the Rahner says that God is the incomprehensible one. All of that linkage, again, the Muslim world moves us to, to try to, to look more closely at uh, our own tradition that way. So, um, that's just a minor attempt to say how we might try to achieve a mutually critical dialogue where each side needs to listen and to look at it. Now, I go back to Kung's thing is, Kung says we'll never have that dialogue until the Muslim world will do historical critical studies of the Quran and of the Sharia, which is their body of law, their development afterwards, the Sharia, and which is extensive, <laughs> large <laughs> commentary by the mullahs and the spiritual leaders. A uh, large body of law 
And uh, until there's critical reading of that, then we probably don't make the kind of progress, at least that would seem possible to some of us. That would distinguish, for example, women's dress questions. You know, that it, then there would be a, new, a modern way of beginning to think about women's dress and veil. The Quran does not tell women they have to be veiled. Also, if we begin to do critical studies of the Sharia in relationship to the Quran, we might find ways in which some practices could change and we could see things in a different way. <coughs> Let me uh, go back uh, to the fundamentalism question now and, the, and this sweep. And here, the book by Karen Armstrong is really good, and also the study of Martin Marty. Martin Marty and Scott Appleby do six volumes on this. And some of you heard Martin Marty was here and talked about it. It was like a light went on for me. And I'll try to summarize Martin Marty's point and which Karen Armstrong buys into. And that is that fundamentalism is really a development of late 19th century and 20th century. And it happens in all religious traditions. It even happens in Marxism. And it's a family resemblance. So that Catholic fundamentalism has things in common with Islamic fundamentalism, Buddhist fundamentalism, Jewish fundamentalism, Marxist fundamentalism. And the way uh, Martin Marty describes it, and Karen Armstrong goes along with, is that the problem is modernity. The problem that the fundamentalists see is the modern world. And the modern world with all of its subjectivism, individualism, all of its consumerism, its uh, freedom turned into license, uh, greed, all the things that make up the modern world, drugs, pornography, all of that, that they, they and their tradition is under attack by that. And it's a life and death struggle. Fundamentalists, therefore, it's a life and death struggle. And what they're going to do is attack. They're not going to sit back and just get defeated. They're going to attack. And where, what are their weapons? They find their weapons within their own tradition. <coughs> find the weapons there. It's, they are not conservatives. Fundamentalists are not conservatives. Conservatives love the whole tradition. They want to keep the whole tradition alive. Fundamentalists don't care about the whole tradition. What they care about is the elements in the tradition that they can bring forward to fight against modernity. And you see it, it once that, I mean, it's like a light that goes on. Once you see that and look at the way the world is moving, we're in a fight for the soul of the human family. Well, and fundamentalism is all over the world. And they are going to use whatever methods it takes very often to make their point. It might mean killing doctors at abortion clinics. Uh -huh. It might be flying planes into the trade center. Uh -huh. But you've got to attack. You have to be aggressive. And you've got to find the weapons that you can use to make this happen. So if you start to think of it that way, Fundamentalisms, whether it's Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, Islamic, are the blockage to dialogue. You can't dialogue with fundamentalists. All, we all know that in here. Whenever we've tried. I mean, they got the answer. They know the truth. No, for the Protestants, it's the biblical inerrancy. For Catholics, it's often the papal infallibility. For Islam, it's, an, it's a part of the Sharia and parts of the Quran use as weapons to buttress their position for a holy jihad or for whatever other reasons one wants to use it. And so you can't have dialogue that way. But that whole analysis, I think, really helps to us to understand what's going on in our world. That's why um, the problem for Islam in all this is the same problem for Christians. How do you live in the modern world by getting, not, without getting sucked into it? How do you have democracy without license, without everything going to pot? How do you take seriously conscience? You know, and the Muslims are not faithful to conscience. They're faithful to the will of Allah. 
and live a sense of, of conscience, of just trying to, you know, it's not, you don't follow your conscience, you follow the will of Allah. No. We get it shaking the head, but you have to save it. I'll, I'll give you time at the I end. Have, I have oh, to. you have to. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> she has to say this. She has to. Yeah. Con conscious is very important in Islam. Can you do it sh briefly? Very briefly. There are two things God asks us as a Muslim to use: use our brain and our free will. And our free will is what controls us between the, the evil and the good within us. This is clearly in, in, in Islam. You know, that's really, there's a lot of things being twisted and, about Islam. It's just beyond my belief that people believe that Muslims don't have conscious and we just, you know, been uh, driven like uh, animals, uh, do this and do that. Absolutely. Islam, the most important thing that we use our brain and our mind. We should not listen to anything, uh, even the Quran. God asks us, read the Quran and ponder about it. And there is the beautiful thing in the Quran that you read the Quran and don't take it as, as whatever superficial things. Ponder about the meaning of the Quran. And then the free will. God tells us in the Quran, you've been created with the evil and the good within you. And your conscience is whatever going to keep you in balance. So it, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And as, as, as a human being... It's very good that you are here. You know, it, it, there's a lot, a lot of misunderstanding. Believe me, it's in the last four years. For me, it's like I am born again and I just came in the right time because I see all what I see around me is misunderstanding and twisting uh, the thing. If I, if, I, if I may say something quickly about the fundamentalist, I think the word is wrong. I call them fanatic in all religion. They are not extremist. Fundamentalist means you're going back to basics, isn't it? Going back to basics, take the Islam. The Muslims, when they were adhering to God's word and God's way, they advanced. And when they lax and they start being immoral and, and, and indulging themselves in the, the materialistic uh, world, they starting the decline. And now they've been humiliated. And I lived in the Middle East and I seen the humiliation and the weakness and the backwardness from the old civilization. So the people just seemed like woke up and say, maybe because we stray away from God's way, we have to go back to basics. So they are trying really hard to, to get that moral value and the family value and all the goodness in, in, in Islam back to, 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 uh, to run their lives. You mentioned civilization. God asked us, you, uh, we created difference so you can learn from each other. So we are obligated to learn from technology of the West, the modernization of the West. But stay away from the bad thing which you mentioned. Pornography, destruction of the family, the bad behavior, the, all this stuff is bad. So going back to Islam really keep us away from this. But we are obligated to inhale the, the new knowledge and new, new technology to advance as human being. So there is difference between modernization and bad behavior and morals, which, you know, I see it really uh, very uh, 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 spreading now in the, in, in the West, and that's what's scaring the, the, the Muslim, and they say, we've been punished, like the people, of, the, the Israelites been punished when they stray from God's words. Now the Muslims believe that they are being punished and been humiliated because they strayed away from God's way. It's as simple as that. I hear some people say, you know, they are against our way of life as America. Middle Eastern, they love America. If, you, they, if they open the door, they will be all here. <laughs> Believe me, it's the freedom, and you can take the good and leave the bad. That's all what I'm going to do again. Um, we are near the end. <laughs> um, we have to allocate the very honest and most it's very, very healing. Um, and I, I will go back to something. I believe that there has to be a criticism in all the traditions in order to progress. And we need to look at our tradition. And when we do all as Christians, we do it in dialogue Islam. The differences and problems and that we need better thing. And hope is that our most friends enter the dialogue with a self-cultural attitude as well. 
where they would be able to take interest and to see. And so um, I don't know if one of pers- I, the fundamental thing, but I, my own conviction is that that is a great category for understanding categories from the Christian world that come in the United States and in the 20th century. And uh, the Christians uh, wanted to purify the faith, called what we're doing, fund- retrieving the fundals, and came known as fundalism. And it's a word used poppy in theological circles. It makes a lot of sense. And it's family resentments that help us. It's the fear of modernity. It's the fear of corrupted by and what's fake is identity. Well, I can't under the pattern, a person who comes to my room with his Bible is going to con me no matter what. You know, it, where's passion come from? Well, if you understand this analogy, the passion comes, but whatever I'm out is undercut his ID. Whatever I'm out is going to rule his whole life. Is going to take away his mission. Leave very being as a person is what is attacked, and therefore he's going to come in and be aggressive. And I think the same is true as we look at all the fundamentals, whether it's in Judaism or Marxism or Islam. It will be aggressive, and um, therefore when we begin to look at the larger world scene, uh, it might begin to dictate some other kinds of policies or some other ways of trying to deal. Um, we should get a better feeling for martyrdom in the Christian world today and what martyrdom will do. You know, we grew on the blood of the martyrs and one can only imagine what it would mean in the Middle East and parts of the world to have more martyrs. A martyred bin Laden will be, have so much more power than he ever could have while he's operating now. That he would become, you know, the great martyr hero for uh, for the Islamic fundamentalists, and one more reason for uh, entering the cause. So I think it's not just theory and theology that we're talking about when we try to analyze this in terms of fundamentalism. It's got practical influence for public policy, for the way we. So my own effort has been to try to reduce the war rhetoric and uh, find another language of justice in thinking about our current situation. I'm going to end with that and uh, thank everybody. I want to thank the doctor for being here and I've listened to you talk before and you've uh, always uh, appreciate that very much and we will officially adjourn. Some people signed up for lunch. 20 in number. (laughs) If you signed up for lunch, lunch is available. If you didn't, Lunch is not available. <laughs> There's 20 such places. Have a good thank one. you. Oh, thank you. Oh, what am I handing that to you for? Oh, oh. No, I heard